Well, I'm delighted that I could spend the whole day here today and a very significant day. He just mentioned um, among many other things. Uh, to me, it's the most important thing that we signed an MOU to have a UNIS Social Business Initiative launched here in uh, Ashoka University. That's for me is important because that brings Ashoka University in our family of all the people who are engaged in trying to see a world uh, in a different way so, so that we can all try our best to think how we can do uh, design things in our own initiatives and in our own uh, creative power to make this happen. So that will bring us closer to each other, closer to the university, closer to you. Uh, hopefully uh, you'll look at it and pay attention to what can be done. And the excitement, another excitement that I had coming to this campus, uh, it reminds me of my beginning when I was in Chittagong University. Chittagong University was, when I joined Chittagong University, was about five years old. So it's about the same age that uh, Ashoka University is. And it was surrounded by villages. Again, very common thing that I see here. And uh, it's a beautiful campus, newly built, because uh, well, this is an additional university built in Bangladesh at that time, in late 60s. Uh, and, and I was privileged to be there. Uh, I came back from the States where I was teaching. Uh, Bangladesh became independent in 1971, December, if you recollect. Uh, with the support from India in a very big way. So we became separated from Pakistan and became an independent country. And I was campaigning in the USA uh, to create the new country. Uh, so this was a big event for us to know that Bangladesh became independent. So immediately after that, I submitted my resignation letter to the university that I'm going back to Bangladesh. Uh, and that's what I did immediately after I came back. And, and became the chairman of the Department of Economics in uh, Chittagong University, the one that I was talking about. So that was all like about excitement. When you have a new country for yourself, suddenly uh, euphoria that you go through, that you feel that as if you'll now turn around everything and make things happen, which never happened before. That's the kind of we are bubbling with all those uh, ideas, all the things that we wanted to do in a new country. But like many other such occasions when uh, new countries are born, exactly the same thing happened in Bangladesh. All those excitements, all those dreams about a new world, new country, started going melting away. Dreams started being replaced by nightmares. Things getting worse and worse every day. And your enthusiasm level goes down because you see it's getting worse than what it used to be before. So that's the crisis that I as a new teacher, young teacher, was going through. And then we were hit by famine of 1974. That's one really gave the crushing blow to me personally. And I totally rejected that subject that I teach. I said, this is a useless subject. It has absolutely no meaning whatsoever. Whatever I teach is just fairy tales. It doesn't reflect the life of the people. So, Previously, what I felt so proud that such a beautiful, elegant theory economics has, anybody will be mesmerized by it. And I was mesmerized too. But now it's the reverse. Saying this is a worthless thing, and I spend my lifetime learning the subject which has absolutely no meaning to anybody. So for a while, I was going through this uh, frustrations that what, how did I spend so much time in learning something which has no relevance in the life of the people. So after a while, I was trying to collect myself back again. I thought, forget about economics. Economics cannot control my life. Why don't I just be a, 
another human being, forget about economics. And as a human being, I can always go and stand next to another human being and see if I can make myself useful to another human being. That's what it should be. Yeah, thank you. That's what it should be. I was trying to address that. But how do we do that? How, where do we begin? That's what the lucky thing for me, I was teaching in Chittagong University, surrounded by villages. I said, ah, real people is right there. Why don't they just walk outside the campus boundary and be with the people? I'll try to find out if there is something I can do to make myself useful to one person in the village. And that's all I can do. I don't know anything else. So I started doing it every single day. I had no idea what I should do. And I did a lot of little things. Every day, I, my promise is every day I must be able to do something for at least one person. So I was also looking for a person that I can do something for. And these are very tiny, tiny things. But this gave me courage, hope, that yes, I'm not all useless at all. I can be some useful to somebody. And then there's a long series of things I did along that path. I skipped that path. But in the meantime, I become very familiar with the village because I'm there, people know me, I know them. I became part of their scene, sit down in their tea stall, talk to people, sit down in their homes, talk to them. Purposeless talks, just to understand, just to see if there is anything I could be, I could be using myself for. And they became familiar. And I started finding out, for the first time, I'm learning something. All those books didn't really give me anything. These are real people. These are real everyday problems that they face. And these are real action that one can take. And I'm part of that. And I look back, I felt this village is my real university. For the first time, I'm learning. And these villagers that spend time with me talking, they are my professors, teach me what the life is all about. And looking back again, I thought when I was in the university, all the series of universities that I've gone through, they gave me a bird's eye view, fly high and see things underneath. And you feel you know a lot because you see a lot, because if you fly high, you see more. So that bird's eye view gives you the power that I know things. Now I realize that bird's eye view didn't give me anything. I really didn't see anything, it's all hazy. I made up stories to tell, flying there. But in the village, I'm very close to people. So I don't have a bird's eye view, I have worm's eye view, little worm. I see very little, but I see very clearly. No problem at all. An advantage of seeing clearly and seeing things right in front of you gives you enormous power to overcome things because it's right there. You can overcome very easily, go around, go over because it's so, you have the topography right in front of you, not while you are flying there. I said, my God, this is what I was missing. And in this worm's eye view, another thing that I started getting day after day is a sad stories, cruel stories about the victimization of people by the lone shark in the village. It's everywhere. They're creeping everywhere. People need money. They give you money. In the name of giving money, they grab everything they got, you got. That's what the lone sharking is. Now that I see it every day, I meet those victims victims of loan sharking. Hear all the stories, horrible stories, ugly stories, one after another. I feel so terrible. Terrible because it's happening right in front of my eyes. Terrible because I cannot do anything for that. And I promise to myself I want to do something. Here I can't do anything. And again I blame my economics. This is the entire learning process that I have gone through. Not a page. Not a paragraph I read about loan sharking, what to do with it. Economics never told me that. In our literature, 
Bengali literature is very rich about the people and their village life and so on. It's filled with stories about loan sharks. But you don't see a line in, fact, in economics. I said, why is that? If it's a reflection of people's life, how come it just walk away? Telling lots of other things, but not about, not about the thing which happens to people. And I felt totally helpless, not being prepared for a situation like that. And out of desperation, idea that came to my mind, I have to do something. Why don't I lend money myself? Very simple thing. If I lend money, people will come to me. They don't have to go to loan shark. And the problem is solved. Looking back, I thought as an academic, probably I would have thought, why don't you start a research project? to study the loan sharking in a village of Bangladesh, a three-year project, <laughs> and study questionnaires, research assistants, and at the end of it, a journal article. It didn't even appear in my mind. I wanted to have it done. So I digged into my pocket and started lending money. Right away, I didn't consult anybody whether this is good or this is bad. I didn't consider anything. Whether they will pay me back, I have no idea. Simply, my immediate attention, can I protect this person so that he, she doesn't have to go to the loan shark? Luckily, it became very popular. If you give money, you become popular, it's so obvious. <laughs> and everybody wanted to come to me to borrow money. And I was getting very happy. I was interpreting that, oh, something is happening, they are happy, and I'm making them happy. And because I'm protecting them from their loan sharks, they can protect whatever little position they have from the grab of the loan sharks. And merely giving this money away, take it. Very simple, whatever you're ready, pay me back, and that's it. The more popular it get, more excited I got. Luckily, I had lots of money in my pocket because I'm coming from the States. I lot, made a lot of money there. So I could go on. And that was the beginning. As you'll notice what I did, I didn't plan anything. It was not out of some planned process or something. It is part of the moment thing. Thought about it last previous night. Started doing the next day. That's it. I had no idea where I'm going, so I had no plan. I had no idea what my expectation is. Simply, one immediate expectation is keep them separate from the loan sharks. So that started rolling on, became bigger and bigger. And it started making little rules to make it easy to understand. And the entire thing was done not by me alone, my class, my students. So me and my students became a big bang, big gang going around in the village, talking to people, giving them instructions, they keep complaining about this. I say, here's the solution. And one thing came in a big hurdle, and I should share it quickly. The decision I made right at the beginning, half the borrowers in my program must be women. Why? Because in the meantime, I, I'm attacking the banking system right and left because my anger is always falling on them, because they are the one who missed out all these people, there is their failure. And as I accuse them that they have done a terrible job by closing down their doors for the poor people. And then I kind of upgraded that accusation by saying not only you don't give loans to the poor people, you don't give loans to women as a class. Rich, poor, doesn't matter. They were very angry. Because when I'm saying something is quoted in the press, it's got a bad publicity, they are very upset that I'm saying all these things. Press is covering because I actually give loans. So I have a voice now. I do something. And they said, no, no, this is not true. You are accusing us in the wrong way. I said, why? This is, we lend money to men, women, everybody. I said, not that, that's not what I understand. Because when a rich woman comes to you, your procedure is 
manager looks at the business proposal and invariably asks the question, have you discussed with your husband? And if she says yes, then the manager says, why don't you bring her along, bring him along next Monday so that we can discuss this. I said, has it ever happened in the history of banking in Bangladesh? A man brought his proposal and manager looks at it and says, have you discussed it with your wife? Why did you bring your wife on Monday so that we can discuss? I said, that's where you go wrong because you are in a completely different plane. So when I began, I wanted to make sure I do not commit the same mistake. I want to make sure half the borrowers in my program are women because in the entire banking system, not even 1% of their borrowers happen to be women. So I have a concrete evidence. I said, look, this is what you do. So I want to avoid that. And that became a big hell. Because women themselves said, no, 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 don't give the money to me. I don't know what to do with money. I never touched money in my life. They're so poor, they never touched money in their life. Said, my husband understands money, I don't. Give the money to my husband. So my students keep telling, no, no, to your husband, we want to give it to you. No, I can't do that. So after seeing this again and again, month after month, my girl students, because boys cannot go and talk to the women, so only the girl students can go. They come and tell me, look, it's a waste of our time because they absolutely cannot do anything with money. They're afraid to touch money. So better we don't push them, force them to take money. I said, well, think about that. When, about, when somebody, some woman says, I never touched money in my life, I'm afraid of money. Always remember, this is not her voice. This is the voice of the history which made her. So that's what she is made of. Neglect and indifference and distrust in her ability as a person. So the family was upset when she was born. They were upset because it's a girl child. They, it brought lots of difficulties for the family. So she grew up with a kind of a feeling that nobody wants her around. So she grew up as someone feeling as if she, she wants to behave as if she doesn't exist so that she doesn't create any tension in anybody's mind. Now you're offering her money. She gets very scared. This will make her visible. She didn't want to be visible. I said, what we have to do, we go back to her again and again. Peel off the fears that she's wrapped up with, years and years of fears that she's grown through, gone through. We have to peel this off by building some confidence, some story, something to tell. But we don't give up. We stay on. Our mission is to peel off the fear. Hoping that someday one of them will say, Maybe I should try. My life is so difficult. Even something goes wrong, it can't be wrong than what it is right now. So let me try. A desperate woman will take the money. If she's successful, it will have a completely different reaction. Her neighbors will become very curious how she to do it. And that will be the snowball effect. It took us six years to come to 50-50 level. We never gave up. Everybody says you are wasting money by giving money to women, um, poor people. On top of it, you want to give it to women? You are totally crazy. We defied things. We continued and made it happen. Suddenly, we saw money going to the family through women, brought so much more benefit to the family than the same amount of money going to the family through men. Everybody kept saying, wow, this is so wonderful. Money going to the family, benefits, to the women, benefits so many things in the family. So I said, well, let's forget about the 50-50 rule. Let's open it up. 
focus on women so ever since we are focusing on women now after many many years 41 years we have 9 million borrowers in gramin bank in bangladesh bank that we created 97% of them are women people the women who are desperate women nothing in their hand they are the one who joined gramin bank and changed their life and we made them the owners of the bank so it's not only they let borrow the money they are also the owners of the bank so along the way what we became known as micro credit micro finance and all kinds of things probably you read about it somewhere and became a global phenomenon what is this micro credit lending tiny money to the poor women is that what the micro credit is maybe is part of it but the real micro credit is the defiance of the entire banking system we really trashed banking system we said you are worthless in system you doesn't you don't mean anything to anything good to people so we changed ev everything they do i was explaining somebody who got keep asking how did you design the gramin bank all those rules uh, procedures So I try to explain by saying, whenever we needed a rule or a procedure, we just look at the conventional banks, the banks that exist around us in the cities, and find out how they do it. Once I learn how they do it, I just do the opposite. Everything we did exactly opposite of what the conventional banks do. They go to the rich, we go to the poor. they go to the city we go to the village after 41 years of gramin bank we have now 2600 branches in bangladesh not a single branch of gramin bank even today is located in any city any town anywhere so we stay on that <laughs> we made a rule we made a rule right from the beginning people should not go to the bank bank should go to people so today we have 9 million borrowers located in 80000 villages of bangladesh that's all the number that we have we have 24000 staff so those 24000 staff have to go and meet all these 9 million borrowers at their doorstep every week rain shine flood doesn't matter this we do in a routine fashion and that's what the gramin bank is and then no collateral the essence of banking is collateral if you drop that collateral banking system doesn't exist anymore we dismissed it everybody said you cannot lend money to people without grabbing something in your hand i said that's what you say we'll try we tried then it worked then say well it may work for few people in one village if you do it in two villages it won't work we did it did it in two I said maybe five we did it in five maybe 10 we did it in 10 we did the whole country still they say the same thing i said maybe if we if you do the whole world it still will say the same thing because your mind is made you can't walk away because that's the bank you understand you can't understand this bank it's not a petty money few dollars today last year 2017 we lent out over 3 billion dollars worth of money we don't worry about whether this money will come back or not because for 40 40 years it have come back why should we worry and it comes back with a 99% recovery record even the conventional banks with all their collateral all their lawyers can't claim that but these women no collateral whatsoever do that every day every for the last 41 years maybe hundreds years more in the future they will do that and not only in bangladesh now it is spread all over the world same result said we are the only bank in the world which is totally lawyer free no lawyers in our system lawyers come in when you have distrust 
You want to make sure it's all papers, pens, pencils, and fine prints, signatures, or stamps. We don't have anything, but it still works. So we kind of discover something, it's another world which behaves in a certain different way. So that's the kind of things that we continue to do. We started noticing many other problems in the poor families. Particularly if you are working with the women, first thing you notice, healthcare. If you are poor, you are poor in health. See, anybody will know that. But nobody pays any attention to their health. So first reaction is to create a system where we bring healthcare for them. So we came up with an idea to give health insurance. We fixed the amount four dollars, four dollars a year, under which your entire family is covered for the whole year. We provide all your healthcare services. They say, "Are you sure you can do that? You cannot cover cost. It will cost you enormous money." I said, "Well, if you have lots of people joining that, there's lots of money. It's no problem." So we started in branch, one branch. That's a trial basis. We got a very good result, and we started spreading it to many more branches. We have doctors right in the village. You don't have to go to the city for medical attention. We have all the paramedics, all the health assistants right there. We make them a kind of a compulsory visit for health checkup. You don't have anything, but you say, "Let's come, come and get a health checkup." What you got? In all the other, we have the pharmacy, we have the lab, testing, and so on and so forth. So we create a lot of those facilities, lots of these businesses. These businesses, we have to cover the cost. Series of them, nearly 60 different companies we created. Some were the eye care hospital, got lots of problems with the cataract operation. So we created the eye care hospital in the village, beautiful hospital. Trained all our staff in the Aurobindo Eye Care Hospital because they are very good in India. So we sent our doctors and nurses to be trained by them. It's a beautiful hospital built. We came to break-even point in four years. We are very excited. Look, it can be done. You can cover the cost. It still serve the people, all kinds of people: people who cannot pay, people who pay, pay a little, people who pay everything, and covered came to break even. In, the, in our excitement, we created another hospital. Now that we came to break even, another part of the country, another beautiful hospital. We came to break even in three years. Then we got more encouraged. We built another one, third one. And then we are now just started constructing the fourth one. It, and we started calling this kind of business where you don't want to make money but solve a problem, a social business. We defined it by saying it's a non-dividend company to solve a human problem. So human problem is this important thing. Create a business model, a revenue model where it money will come back. Not for your making personal money out of it, just to cover the cost. Suddenly it becomes very powerful. You can come up with ideas after ideas, create those, and people love it. And you start solving problems. Now I see this, uh, and you get your money back, whatever you invested. So look at the eye care hospitals. The first one came to break even; they started paying back. Second one come to break even, start paying back. The more money we get back, we invest in the fifth one. And money we get back from the four, five of them, we put in the sixth one. So it becomes an expanding system. If we had to wait as a charity hospital. Imagine how much money we have to raise every year, and how much time we'll be spending to raise that money. In most of the cases of charity programs, charity is a wonderful idea. I'm not uh, discrediting them, but the problem that they face, the problem of raising money, have two things: you spend more time in raising money than the time you use for doing the job, so it's a wastage of your time. And whenever you depend on charity, you remain uncertain. You don't know what will happen to you next year, whether you will have enough money to run them. I said, why can't you do it in a social business way? 
It's very easy. You invest it, get the job done, and money comes back. In charity, money goes out, doesn't come back. You have only one time use of the money. In social business, you do the same thing, but money comes back. So you have a very powerful use of the money. So that's the social business idea continuing. That's how it brought us together with the French company, Danone. And uh, Benedict is here, right here. Uh, she was uh, witness to it, how the whole process went. And we created a social business with a big company, Danone, to address the problem of micronutrients among the children. We create a special kind of yogurt with all the micronutrients which are missing in the children and made it very cheap so the children can eat it and overcome their malnutrition. And suddenly they become healthy and active young people. So this is what social business can do. So the idea, where do we need it? Where do we place the social business in our economic theory? And I said, look, our economic theory is designed in the wrong way. We interpreted human being in a wrong way. In economic theory, human being is interpreted as someone who is driven by self-interest. I said, what a shame. You are interpreting human being as someone who is driven by self-interest? Meaning all human beings are selfish beings? We see nothing but us? And that's what the human beings are all about? And real human being we see around us has both qualities of selfishness and selflessness. But in economic theory, selfless part is completely isolated, given away, it's not recognized. So the selfless part in human being has been blocked out in economic theory. I said, why don't we unlock that so that we can use our selfless part? I'm not blocking the selfish part, selfish part remains. But opening up the part which was locked out by the theory. And as a result, we create a completely different world, a selfish world. And I keep reminding as if our selfish world, the way capitalist system has done us, as if put us a pair of glasses with dollar signs on our eyes. We see only dollar for us, nothing else. And as a result, whole world become a selfish world a greedy world. They have no time for anybody else, only to make money. Why they make money, they don't know. But they keep on making money because that's what the theory said they have to do. That's the question I have been raising. Why can't we open up the other part, selfless part, and create a business on top of it, call it social business? This is what we did. So now we did it in many countries, continue. If we fix this system, with this one amendment, that human beings are both selfish and selfless, suddenly it opens up all the doors to create a humane society. Today, it became a very lopsided society to the extent the whole system became a machine which sucks up wealth from the bottom and pushes in the top. As a result, only eight people in the world today own more wealth than the bottom 50% of the world population. Eight people owning more wealth than the bottom 50%. What kind of world is that? And tomorrow it will be worse. Maybe four people will be owning more wealth than the bottom 50%. And day after it will be still worse. Is this why we study things to make it happen? To dedicate ourselves to create a system which throws all the wealth to a few people on the top? Create a big mushroom of wealth? Expanding mushroom? and to be controlled by fewer and fewer people? And that's a question we have to answer. Is this why we learn to support that system? I cannot support that system. I want a system which shares all the wealth by everybody. That's the system I would like to support, not this one. If we have a social business into the picture, suddenly some changes takes place because social business doesn't contribute to concentration of wealth because you are not taking any wealth yourself. Wealth remains with the business, continues. So this is one thing I've been raising because of the forces that was created around me. Look at the way, the way I dealt. Something else is happening. 
The women, the nine million borrowers, they are illiterate, I told you. We wanted to make sure their children do not remain illiterate. So right from the beginning, we wanted to make sure all the children of Grameen families go to school. So it became a part of Grameen's activity to make sure 100% of the children of Grameen families go to school, remain in school. It's not easy, but we never gave up. So we have a whole new second generation, literate, because we said history must stop. History of illiteracy must stop with the parents. It must not spill over to their next generation. And we wanted to hold it there. And we did. But the children wanted to do more. Not only literate, they want to go to higher and higher education. So we gave them a scholarship from Grameen Bank. We started giving the education loan from Grameen Bank. So now hundreds of thousands of young people with master's degree, with graduation, with PhDs, with engineering degrees, doctors, every, all kinds of professions. Because they are poor children, not, illit not stupid children. Being in, born in a poor family doesn't mean you are stupid. They are as smart as any other kid. Simply, their doors were not open before. Now the door is open. They have gone as far as they could go. But it led to a problem for me. They started accusing me. Why did you send... Yes. Why did you send us to school? There's, thank you. There's no job in the country. So I got very upset that uh, I have no answer for that. Why did you send us to school? Then after a while, I turned around the whole question. I started challenging them. Why are you looking for a job? Did your teacher ask you to have a job? Or your books have told you to have a job? Of course, they cannot answer that question. What kind of question is that? I said, here I am, no job. And he said, who can ask you to have a job? I said, forget about job. I keep telling them job is an obsolete idea. It should have been gone in the last century. This was a stupid idea, and people had realized it, and they will say that was the wrong thing. But they didn't figure that out. So it's still somehow continuing. I said, forget that. Tell yourself again and again. Every morning you get up, you tell yourself, I'm not a job seeker, I'm a job creator and behave like a job creator. A job seeker feels small, he's the mercy of another person or another group of people. Why should, be, why should you be at the mercy of anybody? You are a young person, creative person, you would be on your own. So you should be a job creator, you should be an entrepreneur. And then I started telling all human beings by birth are entrepreneurs. But the economic theory has gave us the absolutely wrong idea. Have to get a job. And so entire education system we built out of the theory that we have behind our mind to create those job seekers. And most of the universities pride themselves, the schools pride themselves. We create job ready pe young people. What a shame to say job ready young people. These are not some kind of a uh, little puppets that we make them job ready and they'll go jump into job and do the job. I said the purpose of education is not to make job ready, it's to make them life ready, which is a much bigger task. How to use my life? What is the worth of my life? What is the purpose of my life? How do I design my life? That's what the education system is all about. Education system is all about knowing myself rather than learning how to do the math, how to do the physics, how to do the chemistry. That can be done anytime. Learning who I am is the most important issue for education. And that's what we should be learning. They remain puzzled. They said, no, oh, they didn't teach us how to start a business. You are asking us to start a business. I said, shame on your education. Look at your mother. Your mother joined Grameen Bank 30 years back. And ever since she's taking a loan after loan, and that's where you're born. Your illiterate mother, 30 years back, took a $30 loan, start a business. 
Did she go to a business school to learn how to run a business? She didn't. If your illiterate mother can start a business who never crossed the boundary of her village had the courage to do it. You know why she did it? I asked them. Because she is a natural human being. A natural human being is an entrepreneur. So you didn't have to think. But your education system made you an artificial human being. That's what you are. You want to serve somebody. You are not your own. So I said, forget about your education. Throw that education away. Go back to your mother. Learn how to be a natural human being. Once you are a natural human being, you'll see the world very differently. I said, in, in the entire history of mankind, we were never seeking job for anybody. Until the capitalist theories came to say you have to work for somebody else. Because that supports their system, not support me, their system, to concentrate wealth for a few people. That's what they do. I said, in it, when we're in the caves, remember? When we're in the caves, we're not sending job applications from cave number five to cave number 10. We went out and got things done. That's what the human beings are all about. We are, we are problem solvers. We are creators. We are full of creative power. And job takes away that right to be a creative person, to be yourself. So I keep telling, but still they get very puzzled. I said, go back and learn how to start a business and come up with a business idea. So we create social business venture capital fund. Ask the young people in Bangladesh, come with a business idea, we'll invest in your business. So it's not a loan, don't be afraid of it. We just become your partner. We provide you the equity and you do the job. When you're successful, buy up all our shares at the book value. You don't have to pay anything extra because you're not interested in making profit. So now young people are coming around. They keep on coming with the business plans and so on. Every, every month we get more, we invest in more than 2,000, in, investing into 2,000 young people today. And every month it becomes a bigger and bigger number. So we have right now over 30,000 young people running businesses with, the, with this venture capital. The difference between social business venture capital and the conventional venture capital, conventional venture capital, you want to make the biggest money possible. We turn it around. We are a social business. We are not interested in your profit. We are here to solve your problem so that we can put you into the orbit. That's what we do. So again, this is another one. If we imagine, if we really become entrepreneurs, all of us, whole world run by entrepreneurs, will there be wealth concentration? No. Because we are all catching our own wealth. We are not mercenaries working for somebody so that he can get all the wealth and own the whole world. Because that's the system today. We work for them, they catch the wealth, they go at the top. And we are facilitating their process. Uh, why should we facilitate their process to get all the wealth combined and to do that? If all the wealth is in this room, all of us are the world's population. All the wealth is on, on this corner. Nobody has a seat anymore. And that's the world we created. All the wealth is in one corner. Nobody else has anything. So we have to create a new world where we'll be sharing the wealth. And to remind that, I keep saying, one human being decide on something they have the ability, they have the creative power to make it happen. The, our problem, we are not thinking that way. Just thinking, not, you don't have to do it right away. Just thinking that yes, we can create a world where we'll all be sharing wealth. We'll come up with a solution. That's what the creative part of human being is. Instead, we blindly follow her everything that, okay, you get your degree, get a job, okay, my life is done. What kind of life is that? So that's the question that I've been raising. It may make sense, it may not make sense. And at the same time, I kept saying that, well, how much money you need? Have you ever figured out how much money you need to take care of yourself, your family? 
I said, come up with the figure. What money, what kind of money you need? If you get to that money, that you take care of your family, emergencies, and all the need, and draw a line, this is the number I want. Once you get there, say phase one of my life is done. I have to work for myself. Then my phase two begins. In phase two, I don't care about making any money whatsoever. Because I dedicate my life for the purpose I was born. To take care of the world, take care of everybody else, and fantastic opportunities to social businesses and so on and so forth. All these problems that we talk about will be all gone and forever. So that's the challenge that we all have to accept. And we have the capacity to do it and make sure we can do it. It's the young people who will do that because young people's mind still remains uncontaminated because you have not finished your school. By the time you finish your school, your minds will be terribly contaminated. Be aware of it. Thank you very much.